I would love to introduce you to Daz. Daz, come on up. So I'm going to give you Daz's official title. He is the Executive Director of Ministry for Fresh Sounds Hope. Sounds good. I'm called lots of things. <laughs> EMDs, great... EDMs. There yep. you go. All yep. those um, acronyms. But what I want to know is, <coughs> taking away the label, taking away the title, mm. who are you at Fresh Hope? <laughs> Um, wherever I am, um, this, this, so I met Jesus when I was 27, even though I was raised as a pastor's kid. So wherever I am, I'm highly conscious that the thing that stays with me forefront is that I'm a son. That's, that's it. Uh, the, the, the role will always produce uh, a desire to be something else other than a son. So I try and live out of my sonship, if that makes sense. So the role itself is designed to serve churches to serve people on the margins, to serve in adventure, to serve in various spaces, to bring the love of Jesus. We want to support whoever that can be, but I don't ever want to depart from being a son. Yeah. So stepping, stepping away from the label and being mm. the person that God is making you to be. Absolutely. Can I pray for you? Please. Holy God, thank you so much for Daz. Thank you for all that he brings to your kingdom, uh, to fresh hope and to us today. Lord, speak through him. Give us ears to hear. Give us an open heart. Help us to listen, concentrate, and be transformed by the power of your word. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It's such an honour. You know, um, it's always an honour to share the word and see some faces that look familiar. So that's beautiful. But to be able to um, see different churches, that's what I get to do in my role as well, is something, I don't know the best image to give you, but there's something profound about seeing the way Jesus is uh, shaped in his body and the multifaceted can I say colour or whatever you want to say, of his body. It's pretty cool. So the gift I have in role is to go to different churches and see his work. It's such a privilege. So thank you for allowing me to share with you this morning. I do hope and pray that you guys would be like the Bereans, just sift and test what I say. Uh, and I, my prayer, because, you know, we're, where words are bound, so does sin, you know. So I'm trying to be careful that I would speak only what is of God and you can just sift that. And I trust the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to let go the things that I may say or miss say and take what he is saying to us this morning. I also want to acknowledge that um, I'm just mindful you guys are in a, a season where there's probably also some grief. There's been change. And I had this thought as I was sitting there, how do we know that you aren't ahead of the curve? How do we know that you aren't? Because I believe that God is doing something in his church this is what I'm seeing in the church from my role. I believe he is, there is, we received a prophetic word actually as a team recently and um, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, you know, to test. Interesting, he says, don't despise prophecies. Why did he say that? There's obviously a tendency to despise them, test them rather, hold on to what is good. And this new, this word spoke of a change in the church, a new wine and a new wineskin. Because the whole purpose of the church is salt and light, and, and we're going to get into some of that. So I'm going to do something with you this morning I've never actually done in, in preaching. It used to be that when I first started preaching, no one recorded it and it didn't matter, but, but now it's all recorded online and people literally could be watching this in the metaverse in the future, who knows. But, uh, so I'll try and be, be careful, but I want to hold that because I do believe, in all honesty, that there is a reframe moment happening in the church and my belief is that God is activating something this network of churches is primarily known for, actually. This network of churches you may or may not know you're a part of called the Restoration Movement was about this. It's called the Restoration Movement, right? Actually, it's a unity movement. Restoration was a means to a means to an end. The end was unity, and that would usher in the kingdom because these guys were pre won't get into the theology of that and to the founders of this movement, they're pre-mill and post-mill, but... They, this was about unity, and I believe there is a work that is happening where things are being stripped and taken, and it does, it actually is suffering. But I was in 2 Corinthians in my private reading recently, right? This is not my sermon, but I'm going to say it anyway. And Paul's going, suffering, 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 and then comfort, 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 suffering, and comfort, suffering. Paul, uh, James says, <laughs> consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. So I've had to do a reframe in my own discipleship to go, look, if I don't acknowledge the reality of suffering and adversity, I'm not going to go too well. And actually, what if those moments of adversity and suffering are invitations to something? And here's how I've come to understand them. 
Because here's the question I ask in this role, what is the church? Like, what is the church? How do we understand what the church is? And there's a guy, quite timely probably in all that's going on in the world, uh, named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who you may know and may have heard. He says this, the church is a group of people amongst whom Christ is being formed. Therefore, this group of people are going to look like Jesus. That is the goal of the church. I want to say your primary vocation, it doesn't really matter whether you are a banker, whether you are a landscape gardener, a pastor, whatever it is, your primary vocation. So helpful if you think this. The whole purpose of your life is to look like Jesus. Now, here's a fascinating idea. If you go all the way back to the patristics, to a guy called Gregory of Nyssa, he said this. He had this crazy word, which I really feel like I've got in this role, die, um, which was epectasis, and it means an infinite stretching, like this infinite stretching. So what if the whole of the goal is that you will keep continually being, I mean, where do you find in the scripture that you'll arrive in heaven and suddenly it's all good? Like, what I mean is, you will arrive, but, but what does that then mean? When you come to face-to-face with Jesus in the new creation, will, there, will you stop learning? Will we stop growing? I don't think so. The early church fathers thought we would continually, infinitely grow. So what if your purpose was to continually grow into the knowledge, mystery, and love of God? That's the purpose of life. So does it matter then how that happens? Whether you're a teacher or a banker or a pastor or whatever it is, the goal of your life is that you will look like Jesus. So, uh, that's the, so therefore, right, if that's the goal, then it's got to be that Jesus said, go, his, his, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So here's the thing I've become convinced of, and I've shared this with churches. Uh, there's a group that did this work and said, look, if you're going to be a church, you're going to have these things called irreducible minimums, uh, which means this is how you know you're now a church and not you know, some sort of a club. You're going to have worship, mission, and community those three. And I like that. I thought, yeah, that's good. People who worship because it's all about God. And that's what this morning, my hope is that you would see the supremacy of Jesus. It's all about him. It's all about, so yeah, worship. And what does that mean though? Because often we can use the word worship, but we, we only mean one narrow thing. But what if it's all of life? What if it's Romans 12? It's the way you offer your body as a living sacrifice. Worship, mission, going out, being like being with people, sharing and showing Jesus, like that, that's it, yeah, and community. And that's the bit that I found tricky. I found that churches in this season, we struggle a bit with community, like with being real, with raw honesty, vulnerability. We're not great at it. I don't know why. I don't know, I, I, like I said, I missed a bit because I grew up as a pastor's kid and then went the wrong way for many years and then met Jesus at 27. So I, I had a gap. <laughs> so I'm not really sure what happened in the church, so to speak, but there is, there is something about the, we, we, maybe it's fear, what Di sort of said, maybe it's fear. I believe we live in a world filled with super anxiety. I just want to say that, right? The world is saturated in anxiety. And every ruler, I was saying this to John before, every ruler since Pharaoh, maybe even earlier, runs their system of rule on anxiety. That's how they get you to make more bricks. Make more bricks. Make, it's like this endless t- task of anxiety. But One guy calls it a super anxiety that we live in now. So if we live in a super anxiety, and you only need to read the news to to do that, how is the church different? How is it offering resistance to this way? Because I I think sometimes, I mean, mostly not churches of Christ, but in some churches, um, they're, they're anxious. Like as in you walk into the service and it's anxious. Thank you for the beautiful way you facilitated our worship this morning and beginning because I felt... I felt genuine peace and joy. Like, I go, yeah, I, I think that's the kingdom. But I've been in places where, well, yeah, I've been asked to fall on the ground in a fit or something like that. And I've even been punched in the stomach by a guy with a water bottle because he didn't fall on the floor in some sort of crazy fit. Like, it, there, there is some weirdness that goes on in churches, right? And you go, what does that have to do with the kingdom? Like, that's not, the church is not an anxious place. Jesus is Lord, my goodness. Like, like, if we really got hold of that, there wouldn't be so much anxiety. And Jesus keeps on the most common refrain in all of Scripture. This is not the sermon I meant to give anyway. The most common refrain in all of Scripture is, do not be afraid because I'm with you. Like, God's presence with us is the elimination of fear. So this is what I find then. You become like who you hang around. So if you hang around Jesus a lot, 
and people who are like Jesus, you become like Jesus. If we don't, then we don't. Paul warns this, bad company corrupts good characters. So you can see how important it is then that every single believer sees themselves as a disciple and a disciple maker. Does that make sense? Not some class of priests and everyone else is the lay or whatever. Every single one of you is loved far more than you know, empowered by the Holy Spirit and able to change this world. You really are. And I think this is what God's doing. He's activating his church again because the church has been a bit sleepy. And we've done some things in our systems and I now sit in a role where maybe, I, maybe, maybe if God would be willing, there's some things we can do about changing that. But I firmly believe in the tenet that really is a foundation for us and it's the priesthood of all believers. That's how Jesus has designed his body. Here's a challenge for you, right? I love doing this. Every time someone says something, I go, does that fit with the body? Because Jesus only has one body, not many. He has many members, one body. Think about that. How often we tear down other churches, tearing down churches, or all these things that go on. Ask yourself this. Does that fit with the body? One head, one Lord, one spirit, one baptism. There's only one body. So I've been trying to go, if I hear a comment, how does that accord with the idea that Jesus only has one, and he is head of his body? Um... So now I'm stuck because I've probably spent 10 minutes doing that intro. <laughs> Got half an hour, so what do we do? Look, the, the, what I wanted to do this morning, though, was to go, I wanted to pick out some things. If, it was, if it's about community and if it's about safe, raw, real spaces, how do we cultivate those kinds of spaces in community? And if I'm a disciple maker, what does it, first, what does it mean to look like Jesus? And I couldn't help but think the primary place we can go is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7, because it doesn't need a lot of unpacking. I can read it, and I'll pick up a few things from it, because I think, and I'm going to read a different translation for you, and the only reason I'm doing that is because, again, I have no idea whether this is, you're new here, and this is the first time you've been here or to a church, or you've been here for forever. I don't know, but I'm just going to read from a different translation. So if you can bear with me, um, I just pray that God will un unstick our ears and, and our hearts to hear this, because it's beautiful, and these are the words of Jesus. So Jesus, uh, just, just now as we read this, um, would you cause a kind of peace and a stillness in our hearts to receive these words? Um, and would you illuminate something that you want to say to us this morning uh, to be more like you, um, to enjoy you, to delight in you, and to show you to, <laughs> to a very hurting world? Um, so we know that your word is power, your word divides bone and marrow, it is your word that is power. It is your word that brings us into being, this cosmos into being, uh, and it is what sustains all things. Uh, so would we enter into the reality of that mystery now as we hear your word in your name, Jesus. Amen. So Matthew 5, now seeing the crowds, he ascended the mountain, and when he seated himself, um, his disciples approached him and opening his mouth, which is interesting because I prayed that this morning. Um, he taught them saying, how blissful. Now, just want to say the reason this translator uses the word blissful is because he felt the word blessed was too mundane. Like you go, you wash it, what, what does blessed really mean? The idea of bliss is actually to do with the divine presence, the presence of God. So it's not trying to be a bit weird and unnecessarily mystical just acknowledging that the blissfulness is actually something reserved for people experiencing a connection with God. <laughs> so, just see, so how blissful are the destitute or that abject in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. How blissful those who mourn, for they shall be aided. How blissful the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. How blissful those who hunger and thirst for what is right, for they shall feast. How blissful the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. How blissful the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How blissful the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. How blissful those who have been persecuted for the sake of what is right, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. How blissful you, when they reproach you and persecute you and falsely accuse you of every evil for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in the heavens is great. For thus they persecuted the prophets before you. And you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should become insipid, by what shall it be made salty? It's no longer of any use except to scatter outside for people to tread upon. And you are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. 
neither do they light a lamp and place it under the dry goods basket, but rather they place it upon a lampstand and it illuminates all who are in the house. So let your light shine out before humanity so that they may see your good works and may glorify your Father in the heavens. Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. For amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth shall pass away, not a single iota or a single seraph must vanish from the law until all things come to pass. Whoever breaks one of the least of the commandments and teaches people to do likewise shall be called least in the kingdom of the heavens. But whoever performs and teaches it, this one shall be called great in the kingdom of the heavens. For I tell you that unless your uprightness surpass that of the the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of the heavens. Now you've heard it said of ancient times, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to judgment. Whereas I say to you that everyone who becomes angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. And whoever says raka to his brother shall be liable to the council. And whoever says worthless reprobate shall be liable to enter Hinnom's veil of fire. That's where we get hell from, the veil of Hinnom. If therefore you bring your gift to the altar and there recall that your brother holds something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Be quick to show goodwill to the plaintiff against you while you are out in the street with him, lest that plaintiff deliver you to the judge, the judge to the guard, and then you are thrown in prison. Amen, I tell you, you shall most certainly not emerge from there until you repay the very last pittance. And you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Whereas I tell you that everyone looking at a married woman in order to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to falter, remove it and fling it away from you. It is expedient for you that one of your members should perish rather than your whole body should be thrown into the veil of Hinnom. And if your right hand causes you to falter, cut it off and fling it away. It is expedient for you that one of your members should perish rather than your whole body should depart into the veil of Hinnom. Moreover, it is said, whoever divorces his wife, he must provide her with a writ of separation. Whereas I tell you that everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of whorishness, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever weds a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear oaths falsely, and you shall render up to the Lord what your oaths are sworn upon. Whereas I tell you not to swear at all, neither by heaven, inasmuch as it is God's throne, nor by the earth, inasmuch as it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, inasmuch as it is the great king's city, neither swear by your own head, inasmuch as you cannot make a single hair, white or black. Rather, let your utterance be yes, yes, or no, no, because it is from the roguish man that anything more extravagant than that comes. And you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, whereas I tell you, not to oppose the wicked man by force. Rather, whosoever strikes you upon the right cheek, turn to him the other as well. And to him who wishes to bring a judgment against you, so he may take away your tunic, give him your cloak as well. And whoever presses you into service for one mile, go too. Give to the one who begs, and do not turn from the one who wishes to borrow from you. And you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and you shall hate your enemy. Whereas I tell you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. And this way, you may become sons of your Father in the heavens. For he makes his son to rise on the wicked and the good, and sends rain upon the just and the unjust. For if you only love those who love you, what recompense do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, well, what are you doing that is extraordinary? Do not even the Gentiles do that? So, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, for time... I want to keep reading, (laughs) but for time, can I encourage you to keep reading this? Jesus goes on to talk about um, our works, um, storing up treasures on earth, not worrying, the problem of wealth, um, the problem of judgment. Uh, He goes on with all these various things, but I think uh, the reason I wanted to read that this morning, I was thinking when we listen to the Sermon on the Mount, it's very confronting. (laughs) And I think we've got two risks. Either we could say that's impossible and dismiss it or we could say what if this was a vision for a human that Jesus thought was possible 
And what is it then to become like him? Because when you read it, Jesus is all of those things. And the, the interesting thing right at the end, this is fascinating, right at the end of the sermon, um, Jesus gives a pretty hard word to people who love to perform and says, look, you'll know a tree by its fruits. So Di talked about a, a tree planted by the streams bearing fruit. It doesn't strain or strive or try, it just does because it abides. But he says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of the heavens but rather the one doing the will of my Father who is in the heavens. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and exercise demons in your name and perform many acts of power in your name? And then Jesus declares to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's pretty much how he finishes the talk. And then says, actually, build your house on rock, not sand. Boom. <laughs> and it's so, it's so hard hitting. You could imagine... And, and Edwina Blair, actually, I went on a tour. So, hey, Ed, if you're at home. Um, Ed took us on a Holy Land tour that I had the privilege of going just before lockdown. And so I can picture in my head where this was being said, right? And it's actually bananas now. So you can imagine these 5,000 sort of bananas and people listening. But you, you've got this fascinating, uh, who's listening to this? Who's hearing this? Because you're going to have religious people, scribes and Pharisees. You're going to have the poor. And here's what I want to say primarily Jesus' ministry. What does he say from Isaiah, what his ministry was about? I have good news for the... <laughs> this whole thing is about like the poor. We, we cannot understand just how much those who are poor, those who are oppressed by the wicked people, this is phenomenal news. Like really phenomenal news. Because there's so many... It, it, the Sermon on Mount is actually really practical. This is what I am fascinated about by Jesus' teaching. I'm in awe of, when, of his teaching because it has this immediate practical reality and then this eternal spiritual truth. And so one of the things that really jumped out at me that I wanted to share, there was actually a few that jumped out that I wanted to share, but here's the thing why I like the word bliss. I know that can be, can be distracting for people, but here's why I liked it. The peace of God that passes all understanding that Paul prays for, that idea is so powerful in a world of anxiety. So I think we have to be resistant as God's people to buying into anxiety. I really do. I, I think we have to, part of our discipleship for one another needs to be to go, as Di said, actually process your fear and your anxiety. Because Jesus says, don't worry. Like about anything. <laughs> like don't worry about anything. Like, like it's not a suggestion. It's, it's a command. So what do I do with that? Like it's because he knows it's for my own good, right? Like, and the, the key word when I was saying it this morning, I was going, oh yeah, because a key gauge for how you're going with your worries is probably how you're sleeping. <laughs> it's a good test. Um, surrender. That's the key word, isn't it? How do you surrender these things when they come? And how do you learn? This is what I couldn't help but notice in this sermon. He goes, do everything quickly. Like as in there's a quickness to not letting things happen. I think one of the things is our speed, uh, which is funny because the world is on speed. <laughs> like it's con but here's what we're to be quick to do. Reconcile. He, he says, I don't care, think about what he's saying, I don't care if you're at the altar offering me a gift, like offering God a gift, go and be reconciled to your brother or your sister. Be quick to do it. In fact, elsewhere in Ephesians it says, don't let the sun go down on it. So I couldn't help but notice, he's going, yeah, be quick to do that. Like, as in, if that comes to your mind, you know, go and do it. But I think the other thing we would want to be quick to do is surrender our anxieties. And you need, you need a safe space to do that. That's what I do. I go, I'm a bit worried about this. I need someone to truth tell and go, why are you worried about that? Like, what have you forgotten at this point? Because there's a verse in Hebrews uh, 3, it says, exhort or encourage one another daily while it's called today, unless your heart get hardened by sin's deceitfulness. If I don't have the gospel applied to me daily, I'm going to be in trouble. Now, that's what the community of God's people, that's why just gathering on a Sunday is never going to be enough for God's people. It's a daily thing, has to be, because I will forget things every day. If I don't have someone gospel me every day, and, and it's not just on me, because I go through stuff, and you do too. We don't feel like praying. I, I don't feel like praying. In fact, I'm angry at God. I don't even know how to say that I'm angry at God. How do I say that safely without getting kicked out? You know, th These are the things that are actually going on for us, so we need safe community daily to go, how do I process this? How do I understand this? And one of the most, I think, so often we can miss things in our translations, but I don't, this morning I would love you to hear how powerful the idea of God as Father is, and the hard thing about that in this world is that men, fathers, have not been great. Just want to say that. There's been, it's, I am a man, 
and it's hard to be a man in this world. Lust, anger, all these things are coming for you constantly. And you can see a great strategy of Satan is to try and take out men who would lovingly sacrifice and lay down their lives for others. It's better to withdraw. It depends on your personality. You might be a really angry person that comes against, or you might be a really angry person that withdraws. Couldn't help but notice the Father heart of God. What that means that God is Father in the beautiful picture. And he says later on, you know, if you're going to, who would give a rock or a stone to a son who asks for a piece of bread? You know, there's something about, we've probably lost it a bit, but we could probably understand as well, reclaim how amazing the fatherhood of God is. And most of our troubles come, I believe, in our fatherhood view of God. Because is God angry, wanting to smite you? Is it possible that God could look at you with delight? Like, how you think about God as Father is very much going to affect how you live. Because you could live in a lot of fear. Now, when it talks about the fear of God, how do you understand that? What does that look like? Versus, say, the fear of financial ruin or, you know, something else. But uh, Jesus is quite clear to say there is something, if you really understood that of God as Father you could probably, probably all of our anxieties would go, if I'm honest. Oh, it would. I know it would. Because if I really believe God's for me, like, uh, why does he teach the Lord's Prayer there? Again, highly practical that he teaches that in this section, because he's trying to say, give us today our daily, like, just give us enough for today. And I get rebuked because it says, yeah, don't run after clothes, don't run after food, pagans run after that. And I go, oh, yeah, there I am again, running after these things. Great the worldliness that's in me. You know, so again, it's ironic because it's the worldliness that produces my anxiety. And then I want people to be kings and rulers to create my anxiety. Like, it's a funny system that we have. That's why I go back to this idea of the priesthood. Like, we need to be all active, all speaking, all involved, not just one person doing things. Otherwise, we end up with a kingly model. And I tell you, kings are awful. <laughs> and we know this. It was the one, one most horrible thing that Israel did. They were offered God as their king. And they said, nah. Give us a bloke. What happened there? That didn't go too well. And I do think there's a season we need to acknowledge that. that there are a, a plethora, particularly of men in ministry who are falling. Like you, you're seeing this happen, right? You're seeing also, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but anyway, you see Will Smith and his response, right? Like, like turn the other cheek. Like it's interesting how many people, like I watch this with my, I've got three daughters. So I watched this with my three daughters and they were all for Will Smith. You know why? Because, this is partly my fault, but they were watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And so they saw something about Will Smith and they like Will Smith. They go, he's great. I go, that's horrifying what he just did. Like, you watched his ego. You watched his anger. Just lose it, right? What did Chris Rock have? Uh, Dignity, actually. Which is kind of, I saw it right there in this. Like, Chris Rock could have done lots of things, but, but he didn't. He, so, so there is something about the wisdom that is laden in this. I'm sorry, I've got a million thoughts. As you can see, I'm going everywhere. But as, as, as I try and land this with all these ideas, I wanted to say that I believe if we sharpen one another's iron sharpens iron, which I believe is the proverb, that's what we're meant to be for one another, that that's what our quest is. Our concern for each other is not what we do for jobs or not what, it, but actually how we're looking more like Jesus. That process is painful. Jesus said this strange line. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with it. I still don't have an answer, but he said, everyone will be salted with fire. What did he mean? Because <laughs> fire is testing. Fire is lots of things. But here's how I understand it. Brothers and sisters, we are going to face trials. We have all through history. I don't like to say it, but in our adversity, there's an invitation to our awareness. So this is how I understand discipleship. We have an invitation from our adversity into awareness. From our awareness, we have a movement into acceptance. And then from our acceptance, we have a movement into awe. Now, here's what each of those words mean. I'm turned against, I'm turned on, I'm turned in, and then I'm turned out. Think of it like a, a spiral like this. When you have adversity, something has come against you, that is your invitation to go, okay, God, this is what I do now. I do it with my daughters and myself. What are you inviting me into? There's something I'm not seeing and now is an opportunity to see it. I'm not saying you do that second one. I'm just saying at some point you go, okay, now I have awareness. This is so critical because most of us are blind, right? So, so we, we, and we're blind to our blindness. I can't see it unless <laughs> something happens. So in my awareness, I then have a, an ability to process it. And I call that, a, that's the acceptance piece. Because there's bits you can never change about your life, 
and there's bits you can. Don't you find that the wrestle? Like, God, what, between this line, like, as this points out with our works, God, do I, when, when do you do it and when do I do it? Because I keep bumping into you. I feel like as I'm dancing with God, I'm treading on his toes. I do have big feet, but I feel like that's what's happening because, God, do you do that or do I do that? I don't know. I'm, and I think somewhere in between there is probably the secret to the spiritual life. And I believe, sorry to say this, because I'm going against 500 years of tradition, I believe there's been a massive error in our understanding of works. We have gone so far down the pendulum of grace alone, and I am, I am all about grace. <laughs> but what we've done is thrown out the works with it. And so we've accepted behaviours and other things because we're grace people, and we've thrown out the works thing. I just want to say, I'm sorry, I know it's a bit challenging. Please feel free to take me up on it. But the reason I think that is because how else can you read the Sermon on the Mount? How else can you give your cloak to the one who asks you for one? How else can you go the extra mile? Here's, here's the amazing thing, and I'll, I think I'll close with this. Yes, I'll close with this. Here's the amazing thing. I believe Jesus comes to reverse all the effects of the fall. That's what he does. Here is the primary thing that he did. If you think about when we ate from the knowledge of the tree of of good and evil, right? Which means we're now judges. We weren't judges before. Our whole paradigm with God prior to the fall was relational decision-making. I walk with God in the cool of the day. It's not about right or wrong. It's about relationship. Jesus comes to restore a relational paradigm to humanity. He says, you know what? You now love God and love others. That's how you make your decisions. No longer on law. No longer on good, evil, good, evil, categorizing. Satan is set against us. Actually, it's crazy. His name, when you read it, is Kategiros. What word does that sound like in English? Categories. There's only one category of humanity. Image bearer. Every single human. Every single human is an image bearer of God. But Satan will want you to go, no, 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 that person's that religion, that this, that. And notice what Paul says, yeah, the dividing walls of hostility. There's no male or female, slave or free. There's only one in Christ. That's the unity purpose. You see, this is the work that he's doing. He is building unity, not these dividing walls of hostility, which is the whole world that we're set against. So if you think about Jesus restoring what had gone wrong, he is prioritizing relationship as your decision making. So here's the thing. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm trying to help us understand around good works because there's lots of good works. You can't read Jesus without understanding the idea there should be some kind of goodness. You can't read the prophets without thinking that. There's a philosopher named Esamik. She uses this, forgive the big word, but it's called subsidiary focal integration. Think of riding a bike. It's so deep within you, or surfing, I surf, anyone who surfs. Um, I never look at my feet when I surf, nor my feet when I pedal a bike. I look ahead. Here, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. So you should spontaneously erupt with good works that you don't even know about. That's why Jesus says here in the sermon, I'm sorry I didn't get to read it out, but don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Right? Because it's not about doing good. It's about honoring God. It's about loving him and loving neighbor. So therefore, I guarantee you, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer actually said something very similar, a Christian should never even know when they're doing good. Because when you do that, the moment you do, your brain goes, good, good, you know, or good, evil, good, evil. But it's actually, no, no, I just want to express my love for God and others. And I guarantee you, you will do far more in this world. You won't, probably won't even know about it. And that's probably a good thing. Because otherwise, if we think we're doing good, <laughs> I'll just make an I statement here. That won't go well for my ego. Because I'll be filled with pride. And that's sort of also what Jesus is. So we're threading this line. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, it talks about the narrow way, not the wide way. We are trying to walk this very narrow, perilous road. And that is between, it is between that space of saying, God, I want to live for you and obey you. I want to do everything you say. Jesus, I follow you. You have my heart, my loyalty, my everything. I just want to follow you. And, and, and I want to do good in this world and I want to make a difference. But if I swing this far and suddenly I start thinking, I know what's good, I'm probably going to end up in trouble. So help me with that too. So that's why I actually quite love the beauty, like deeply love the beauty of following Jesus because it is always first relational. What, how good is that? 
It's never about knowing when you've done good or evil. That's actually our problem with the fall. The, the, the quest now is love God, love others as you love yourself. That's why I think we need to do some of that internal work too. Like so I said, you know, a surrender or confession of fear. You know, it's really interesting. We are meant to be a... Right now in my church, this is the sermon that someone else is giving, but confessing community is important. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, that the church is a... Now it doesn't mean you stand up and have to share conf- with every, but you do need someone. You need someone to share your anxieties, your fears, your sins with so that you might be healed. That's actually what James says. Confess your sins to one another so you might be healed. So we need to be, as the church, activated priesthood, all believers. You don't need me to pray for you. You, you don't need it. You counsel you. you. Everyone can do that for everyone. <laughs> right? I need counsel. My kids counsel me. And they do it better because they know they, they can hold me against my theology. But seriously, my 12-year-old the other night was amazing in helping me. So, and that's, I think that's the way the kingdom works. We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I've given you 7,000 thoughts probably now. I said to John I had 7,000 thoughts this morning. So I'm sorry that that's been such a, a thread. Hopefully something of that might pop. But I think what I would want to say is that Jesus is phenomenal. Following him is the way. And I believe our non-anxious, peaceable, we are a people of peace, is going to be such a powerful witness. The way we can sharpen one another is to not buy into the anxiety and fear that is prevalent in our world. And that's probably one of our key quests. How I do that, another sermon, is Sabbath. I literally maintain both my sanity and... Where's John? I was talking about John this this morning. Because the world is all about efficiency. Sabbath is very inefficient. (laughs) And I bound it. I go, I know Sabbath can risk legalism, but I bound it from Friday night to Saturday. How do you think that feels when I go to give a talk on Sunday? (laughs) Am I prepared enough? Maybe I'm not. Maybe you're seeing the evidence of it. But, But the priority is that I spend time with God in rest. His security, his control, his authority. The world doesn't need me. As I started in this, we die this conversation. It doesn't matter if I'm not in this role or I'm not. It, that, that's irrelevant. The world goes on, but, but in my busyness, if I don't stop, I can think, oh, actually, this, this, this organization needs me. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But God has decided to, and that's why, pour out his love so I can remain a son through all the seasons. So, our powerful witness as a church, I believe, at the moment, is going to be a non-anxious presence, resisting the anxiety of the world and doing whatever you can in a world that is flooded with anxiety. And you know that. You know people and you know their fears. You know it. And I think, I believe, uh, my predecessor said the church should be a repository of wisdom. And I believe this is part of what God's doing. As we, There is a new wine that's coming I really believe that. I think there is a new wineskin and it's actually a very old one (laughs) because it's actually the original design of the church, which was everybody active, fully alive. I'm going to pray and hand over and we can sing. Father, um, in all of that, (laughs) all of those ideas and thoughts, um, we just declare our love for you because you first loved us. And as we have shared in communion in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, we thank you for that reality that we have eternity with you to grow, to enjoy and to delight in you. I pray that as we leave this space today, would what is of you in this morning stick? And and would we be a people that are a city on a hill? We would be salt and we would be light. We, We need your help. And so would you fill us with the fullness of your Holy Spirit to this end? And we pray this in your good name, Jesus. Amen.